WNMF coming up quickly, but first, the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra has a special show this weekend. You're listening to Winnipeg's Classic 107. My name is Simon Rusnak. The Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra presents Pierre Gint, best known for its brilliant incidental music scored by Edvard Grieg. This production allows the audience to dive more deeply into the fantastical world created in the Heinrich Ibsen drama with special guest performers and a very special guide, narrator John Delancey. The venerable American actor, director, producer, writer brings his hallmark voice to the production, and I'm so excited to say that John Delancey has joined me in the Classic 107 studio this morning. Hello. Good morning. Well, what a pleasure it is to have you here. My pleasure. And I'm, I'm, I'm so excited that you're in town. There's so much that I'm looking forward to chatting about. But first, I, I figured since this is a, a classical music radio station, we'd begin with a, a little bit of music. W- would you mind giving this a quick listen? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, does this sound a little familiar? Yes, yes. <laughs> and here I thought it was going to be, you know, I don't know, it could have been Pierre Gint or it could have been something that my father did, but yes, yeah, Star and he- Trek. Here we are, a little bit of Star Trek, right. uh, the, the main title. There it is. You've got to wait for the brass. It just sounds yeah. so, so magnificent. Yeah. Um, that, of course, um, uh, iconic music, um, a show in which you appeared as the now legendary uh, character, the wildly and omnipotent Q. What goes through your mind when, when you hear that music? <laughs> well, it actually caught me by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I guess I, you know... My career is that it, it's the tomato that's stuck on the wall. Well, that's that's sort of what it what happened. Well, the the reason why I wanted to play that is I know that there are a lot of listeners who are mm-hmm. Trekkies who are who are right. dedicated right, parts right. Of, of of the fan base, right. and um, you know, this is a role that you've reacquainted yourself recently with um, right. in, in Picard. How, how did it feel to to reunite with Q? You know, it was fun. Um, I went in for a meeting. Uh, they said, you know, would you come in? We could talk about it. And I had, I said, listen, I only have two questions. The first one is, you're not putting me back in those tights again, are you? <laughs> <laughs> because that would be very, really unseemly. And the other, which was a, a serious question, is, is are, we, are we recreating or are we creating? Are we going backwards or forwards? And they said, we're going forwards. And I went, okay, I'm, I'm on. And here you are. Um, yeah. uh, the other reason why I play that is because we, we already got a couple calls this morning when I, I was talking about you coming on air. People said, you have to ask about Picard. You have to ask about Q and, and being part of Star Trek. And I mean, I was, I was just skimming through um, your, your incredible resume. And um, if, if people don't know you from Star Trek, perhaps they know you as the grief-stricken uh, Father Don Margolis in Breaking Bad, or maybe they've heard you as Discord in the animated uh, My Little Pony <laughs> series, or going yes. even further back in your right. acting catalog, your portrayal of, of Eugene Bradford in, in Days of Our Lives. Um, you've been part of some some really iconic franchises. H- how does that 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 feel for for you as as an actor and as an individual, being such an integral part in, in, in so many people's lives and so many different facets? Well, you know what's sort of interesting is that I don't live in that world. I I, I sort of don't live in the twentieth or twenty first century in a way. I, I live kind of in a classical, you know, many many years ago. So, yeah, yeah. So um, I. I and also, I, I didn't really watch a lot of television when I was a kid, not because I didn't want to, but my parents pulled the television out of the house because I had I had distinguished myself with uh, five F's and a D. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, perhaps no more television. So these are things which I kind of go, oh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, when I was on Star Trek, it wasn't until a couple of years later that somebody stopped me in the street and they and they said just this, you know, oh, my God, you're, you're so important to science fiction. Well, I love science fiction, but I never thought of myself as being mm-hmm. in science fiction. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. It's, it's strange. It's strange, and yet it's just it's, it's sort of part of what you do, right? That's I mean, right. for the Trekkies, yeah. for the bronies out there, for the daily watchers of Days of Our Lives, um, you are an integral part. And, and, and it's very exciting to have you here in Winnipeg. You, you mentioned um, the TV being pulled out of the house in your early years. And I want to go back to those very early days because you grew up in a musical household. Your father, um, the legendary oboist with the Philadelphia Orchestra and later director of the Curtis Institute of Music, John Delancey. Was, was music ever in the cards for, for you? I was explaining this to one of the uh, oboe players last night during rehearsal. I um, uh, I was asked just that question. Actually. Yeah. She said, "Do you play? Did you do you play the oboe? Did you play the oboe?" And I said, "My father came to me. I was probably eleven or twelve, maybe right right around then. He said, um, 
I'm, I've organized for one of my students to give you oboe lessons. And I went, uh, okay. And, <laughs> and, and about six weeks later, later he said, um, okay, I want to hear your lesson. Come into the studio. So I played for about 10 minutes, and he went, you'll never be a professional. Find something else to do. <laughs> and, and you found acting. <laughs> no, I found acting. And, and, and it's found just acting. as well. It really is just as well, I mean, yeah. honestly. Uh, I mean, the, the, the story that I always come back to, and I mean, I've, I've recounted this story countless times. In fact, every time we put the Richard Strauss Oboe Concerto to air, I'm, I'm sure you know this story um, very, very well, but the, the story of um, uh, during the Second World War, an American corporal um, who met a rather, at the time, old Richard Strauss, who had all but finished composing, and 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 um, this corporal suggested maybe he should write a concerto for his, his instrument, the oboe, and, and that was your dad. I've, I've recounted that story countless times. Is, is that one that, that you heard as a kid growing up? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the depth of that story is, is, is more, you have to understand, Strauss was very involved with the, um, I, I don't mean p- perhaps ideologically, but certainly... Um, Physically, physically, he was yeah. with with the with the regime at the mm-hmm. time, and then now was a new regime coming in. And since my father was in the OSS, and he had come to visit him and what have you, I don't know if that had kind of prompted him to go, "Gee, maybe I should take this seriously and <laughs> write an oboe concerto." So that's that's kind of the story there. Well, I'm glad you give us a little bit more backstory because again, yeah. it's one of those that I've read about, but it's it's nice yeah. to hear a little bit more. Yeah, of the story, I have right? pictures of him uh, on. You know, I don't know, overlooking the Alps, some yeah. some house, and it's, it's it's Strauss and my father and some other guy. This is wild. Yeah. I mean, it's really, really yeah. wild. Um, so music has always been a part of your life, um, and you've sort of found a, a way to combine acting and, and music with symphonic narration and, and also um, production and, and, and many other engagements with orchestra. And I want to get to that because that's why you're here in town. If you're just tuning in, I'm chatting with John Delancey, who's in Winnipeg to perform with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra in narration. Um, this is something that you've done uh, plenty of uh, across the continent with the New York Philharmonic, the Los Angeles Phil, the National Orchestra, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the list goes on. What's special about this unique form, um, symphonic narration? Um, as a kid, I used to go to, as you can imagine, tons of concerts. I wasn't expecting you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the narrations that I saw, I always loved. I mean, Danny Kay. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were sort of silly in some of them. But some of them were really quite wonderful. When I was asked to do it for the first time, which was with the L.A. Phil, in fact, Pierre Giddens. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I then was asked to, and then I did it with Mazur in, in, in uh, New York, what have you. I I went through that the regular repertoire, right? But understand, in many instances, that this music originated with the theater piece, um, Mendelssohn's Midsummer uh, Night's Dream. Midsummer Night's Dream. Well, it was it was, went to Shakespeare's mm-hmm. Midsummer Night's Dream, and in this case, it went to Ibsen's uh, play. Uh, so I began to think, well, you know, I would really like to bring this back closer. So um, I did a lot of the narrations. I began to um, plump them up a little bit more. That ended up me t- doing gala performances mm. of, of where I would do Romeo and Juliet, but I'd use 11 or 12 different composers, mm. two actors, two singers, two dancers, a chorus, and stuff like that. And then it got really silly where I had 65 animals on stage because <laughs> it was a whole show about you know all the music that, that composers have written about animals and yeah, insects yeah. and this and that and that. And so we created all those things. And then I went and de- de- uh, developed a, a series for the L.A. Phil, which was called Voices Within. Or excuse me, that's another show, uh, which was called First Nights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And First Nights was, what was it like to be at the opening of the Rite of Spring? What was it like to be, you know, let's delve into Mahler's first and stuff like that. So, again, actors on stage, um, but not just in a line, but actually integrated into mm-hmm. the orchestra. Mm-hmm. So what the audience is going to see tonight or Saturday, uh, yeah. Saturday night is um, is the story of Pierre Gint. Interestingly enough, when uh, Ibsen asked his friend Grieg to write the incidental music to his poem, by the way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, 
uh, and he and Grieg came back with his music. Um, Ibsen said, "Gee, the, the music is great, but it's not my show." Yeah, where yeah. do you go from there? Where do you go from there? So, and Ibsen actually wrote a cautionary tale. Yes, it's it's the roguish guy mm-hmm. and what have you. But the roguish guy back then was doing things that we now consider really, uh, really inappropriate. Mm-hmm. And even back then, it was considered inappropriate. And it's the story of a of of a guy who has a lot going for him, who ends up squandering his life. And um, that is that is a, um, a very current story. And so um, I just thought, let's let's make sure that we get that part of the story because that's the essence yeah. of the story. The sort of existential question right. of, of identity, right? right? And, and what if I I have wasted? I I have squandered my life. My the empire I was looking for was in fact always here. Yeah. And I and I did a lot of kind of unpleasant things along the way without understanding what and, he, and there's a wonderful speech in it I mean a, a wonderful moment in it mm-hmm. uh, it's called the onion speech where he uh, appears sits by a brook and he and he and as I say in the, in the script that I wrote uh, for the first time in his life thinks about his life yeah yeah and he gets to his core he's peeling the layers he's back, pe- right? peeling yeah. the layers back and he yeah. goes my god at the end he goes there's nothing there yeah, you know, like an onion. You, yeah. there there is no kernel yeah. in an onion. Yeah, yeah. And you go, There's nothing there. So so that's it. That's the thrust of this show. Yeah, um, yeah. we know it. I mean, I, I'm so glad you got into it because I did want to ask you about that about about the the work itself. As, as you say, this this poem, this this verse, it wasn't written out as a, a stage play um, originally. I, I I don't think. Um, well, it was a it like was a, a stage. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but I mean, how it was written poem. out. Yeah, drama or yeah, whatever yeah, the proper it, term yeah, would be. Yeah. Um, but but I'm, I'm glad you get to that because this is one of those works that we we know for the. The music, right? I mean, it is it is iconic. It is appearing in cartoons. It is it is yes, music that every we've heard. laxative commercial <laughs> in the world uses. You know, yeah, da, my morning da, has da, never da, been better. Da, 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 yeah, da, da, yeah, the old morning right, constitution, right? right? I mean, right. that's not something I was right. expecting to talk about. But right. hey, here we are. Yeah, um, it, it is just one of those almost ubiquitous pieces of music, and 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 yet it was written for this this profound drama, this fantastical story. So I'm I'm really excited for what the Winnipeg audience will get to see this weekend. Special guest performers, uh, two sopranos, Andrea Lett and, and Julie Lumsden, along with the University of Manitoba singers and, of course, the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra led by Maestro Daniel Reiskin. Um, just to kind of round this conversation out, I, I suppose I have kind of two more questions. Um, I, I mentioned um, some of the, the fans of yours that are here. Again, we got a number of calls already this morning about, oh, John Delancey's in town. Did you know Q is here? I mean, these are these yeah. are things that live with right, you. Right, sure. so, so I'm thinking of those who are Mm-hmm. Of course, classical music has a, an audience that is, in a way, equally dedicated, right? They are passionate right. About, right. about their listening and about what's being presented. But there's also those who may be experiencing the symphony orchestra for the first time. And I know this is something that you do. You help contextualize the music and, and to give people an in to this, what could be um, sort of stuffy or there's this preconceived notion of classical music. What do you say to those who are going for the, for the first time to the symphony this weekend to see Well, this is Pierre a Gint? perfect concert to come to. It certainly this is. This is a perfect concert to come to. The The music is very accessible. Um, I, you know, I, I also did, uh, I was the host for the ch- children's concerts for the LA Phil as well. My feeling about music is that my job is to get people on the bus. Mm. I don't teach I, I'm not going to talk about Kirkle listings and yeah, yeah. Not nonsense like that. I want to get people on the bus. Once they're on the bus, they will discover a, a world that is, as you know, really quite marvelous. This is a show which um, certainly gets people on the bus. Mm-hmm. Um, great, great orchestral moments. Wonderful. I've taken the Solvay song, um, which is so... I don't know. It makes me cry. Yeah, actually, it's, it's beautiful. And I've and I've opened it up and used it many times through the uh, through this this particular show. Um, so I mean, y- you get to hear things, and also people who don't go to a symphony orchestra often say this to me: "Oh, the sound yeah. is completely different." Yeah, you're not listening through two little speakers on your TV, right? Right. It's right. A, it's an all-encompassing experience right, that way. Exactly. And so it's one of those that you you 
it can't be replicated. You no. might have your 5.1 surround sound system, yeah. but it is not the same experience it's as being the in the same. hall right. and truly feeling those reverberations with all of those around you. Yeah. It is certainly going to be a special show. Um, John Delancey, a great honor to welcome you to the Classic 107 Thank studio. Thank you. My delight. Great to have you in Winnipeg. Uh, in town this weekend with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra and special guests performing Pier Gint. Uh, that's coming up on Saturday, uh, this Saturday, and uh, 7.30 p.m. at the Centennial Concert Hall. More details up at Classic107.com under the events tab or WSO.ca.